two, one, you ready? Uh, holding this family again. Uh, uh, we're going to take a few moments and give a testimony of uh, the kind of time that it is that exists, particularly here in Israel. And then we will, I want to give an introduction to the class by starting with something that I heard on line yesterday from one of the sisters. I'm very empathetic and very, very much concerned that the sisterhood clearly understand what's being taught and the significance of the role that they must play. And certainly they got to understand what it is that they're being taught in order to, you know, activate that which must be done for us to be successful. Uh, I, I, I really, really uh, want to emphasize that to the sisterhood, if any sisters are on at this point. And those of us, you know, that understand uh, what we are providing for one another, we need to really emphasize this into the sisterhood and try to simplify things as much as we can. Very, very critical. Now, today what happened here in the land, now I've been in the land since 1973. Um, this is like a 20 year in interval for me. I was born in the Southern part of, you know, Tennessee and close to Memphis. And I left in 1953. And I remember the day that I left, I drove up with a brother that was pursuing one of my sisters. And um, his name was Noe. Name is no significance, but I'm just sharing you the details of how well I remember. And I'm like only 13, 14 years old at the time. But I was able to drive a car. Yeah, I didn't drive from Tennessee to Cleveland, but I remember when we got into Cleveland, uh, we was coming in, major, major snowstorm, major snowstorm, major snowstorm. Um, it was a 53, 1953 Crown Victoria Ford, pink and gray. You know, so very detailed, you know. And I remember as we was going into Cleveland, we was going up the hill into Cleveland, and I noticed how the car was, you know, shifting from one side of the road to the other. And of course, this concerned me. Now, it snowed in, in Tennessee. You know, I had some very bad snowstorms in Tennessee, you know, when I was growing up. So, but, but anyway, we get to Cleveland, and, you know, I entered school and everything. And this is where I... I grew up at, you know, and then 1973, I come into the knowledge of the truth. I heard, you know, immediately when I heard, I understood. And immediately, less than a month's time, I had liquidated everything, me and my wife, and we were ready to come to Israel. But I believed all of this by, quote unquote, what you call faith. And this is going to be key. So I want you to really take note, sisters, take note about faith and belief, because this is going to become problematic if we continue to view what you're being taught from a faithful or a point of belief. It's going to become very problematic. So anyway, I believe this by faith. I came to Israel and I was ready to you know, I was asked by the elder priest that I want to remain with my wife. How ignorant I was, I'm ready to give my wife up for this belief here if she didn't, you know, uh, didn't want to be with me, you know. And uh, she had already told me when we left, coming to the state of Israel, she was always waiting on me. Whatever decision I made, I wasn't going to be able to leave and take my daughter and come to Israel 
and leave her behind. So she was she was just waiting for me. So when I made the decision, she followed me. But once I got to Israel, all of a sudden now I'm questioned by the high priest. You know, y'all want to still be together, whatever. You know, and so I'm ready to whatever for this belief thing that I'm talking about. Very very significant. So anyway, I'm here in Israel since '73. And of course, I was one of the first one to be sent out on a mission back to Ohio to get my spiritual father, uh, which later on became a prince, you know, for whatever that's worth. Three princesses came out of Cleveland, Ohio myself, I see kids there, and I see Eliab. And I see Eliab and I used to work on a job together. She always tell me, Save your money and don't tell white people your business. Well, I wasn't saving no money and I didn't have no business that I thought white people didn't know. It's just, I'm giving you how real this is. <laughs> so as we, you know, progress to matriculate through this doctrine of the kingdom, all the things that has always happened for the weather was concerned, we always connected to all oh, the Nisikim, which was the highest level of leadership when they would go out, you know, to the America and they would be on their way in. The seemingly the weather would change, at least we believed it was, and they were controlling the weather that that. that. But today, uh, I saw something different. And of course, uh, we're going to kind of verify it as we go forward. Uh, our collage was at my house, and you know, uh, we have never seen the weather at this time of year. Usually, we talk about Passover during the season of Passover. You know, uh, it don't rain; skies are clear. You know, all the way up until October, November. We always boost about that. You know, but. The rainy season is supposed to pass. So today, unbelievable rain came down along with hail. I mean, hail was so hard hitting my front door that it piled up at the door and like somebody was trying to come in. That's how hard it was. Wow. Rain flooded my whole room where my computer and where I'm sitting at now, everything was flooded. Kalias sat down and he said, now see, he said, what is right now on your light, your fan in the ceiling? I mean, it was unbelievable. Unbelievable. I've never seen anything like that. Uh -huh. For my wife, Kamuda, I happened to call her later on. She happened to go out, left her window open, destroyed her television. She's now trying to go buy another television. And I heard sirens all over the city. Who knows what happened? You know, the streets was flooded and everything. Wow. Unprecedented. Unprecedented. Now, what did that say to me? That's a sign for me of the significance of the shift in energy. And we've been talking about this feminine energy, how significant it is. And we talk about nature. And you always hear me talk about how nature and language, you know, causes what? Nature and the way people act and the way people do things is always in opposition to one another. It's never unified. So, and I'm saying that to say, this is why the weather, you know, is so sporadic and whatever, because of the duality that exists. There is no harmony in the earth. There's no harmony in the earth. So we find ourselves in opposition to how the creation functions. Now, I laid that point for this reason. I don't want us to no longer say wholeness as just a cliche right. and, a, and, a, and as what you call a greeting. Right. Okay? We got to get beyond wholeness as being a greeting, you know, of peace and, you know, wellness and all that and shalom. I don't want us to see wholeness. 
what I want us to see wholeness is, is an organic function of the cosmos. The organic function of the cosmos. Now, that's critical now, that's critical in terms of the way we think. We think dualistic or dualism, which is, you know, the concept or idea that is part and parcel of or the foundation of the inorganic simulated reality that Etai was explaining yesterday about the matrix and the mentality within the simulated reality. This is monumental now. This is really monumental. We gotta, we gotta really function on this because if we don't, we're gonna find ourselves creating problems that should not be problem for us. Right. You know, on an organic, energetic, and simulated Genesis and realm. So this concept, you know, of wholeness, it can no longer just be a greeting. When you utilize it, you got to begin to function your thought process on this is an organic, you understand, concept, idea, and function of the entire cosmos. And if not, you find yourself under the influence of dualism, you know, and you'll be greeting in the dualistic way as a concept, an idea, a way of the inorganic simulated, you know, function of the reality in the physical realm. Now, I said that to say that the aberrant man has to be understood in terms of the tools that he has provided you with to function within the simulated reality. Uh -huh. The tool that he gave you to function with, you got to understand it as being artificial and fictitious. It's unreal. It's unreal, but it's perceived to be real because of our programming. And it goes back to why it was important for him to give you this, you know, uh, fictitious, uh, artificial way of viewing things. And I go back to the little article that we got, our greatest power over blacks now and that's that, that's that's specific that's particular that's you know actually pointing to where they're utilizing their power but ain't nothing mythical about it he said the greatest power over blacks is that we control everything they believe so if what i believe is controlled by somebody else then he's controlling my behavior He's controlling what I accept, what I believe, what I desire. He's controlling it. Now, when we look at this power, and we've been talking about power versus force, so then he really don't have any power. What he's doing is calling you to use your energy, which is power, your energy to what? Except what he has given us as being real and once that's accepted there you go once, right now we we came up with the uh who, who who where this came from uh alkalize is he on i think he said that this came from the writings of not frederick douglas but uh It came from uh, writing a book of the miseducated Negro. Right. Who is the author of that book, Etai? Uh, wow, I had just what? had it on the tip of my tongue. Hold on. Let's find out the name uh, of it. Yeah, I, I, I'll get it. Carter G. 
Carter G. Woodson. Carter G. Woodson. Carter G. Woodson, right. Carter G. Woodson. Now, what did Carter G. Woodson state about the black person, you know, about how he, you understand, thought if he went to the front door and he was not able to come, be allowed in, he would go to the back door and cut a door in, uh, something to that way. But you understand what I'm saying. I, I think oh. I'll, read, I'll read the quote for you if you don't mind. Because please, it, please. Uh, it, it, it reads on this wise. When you control a man's thinking, you do not wor have to worry about his actions. You do not have to tell him not to stand here or go yonder. He will find his quote proper place. End quote. Is that what that happened to us? That's correct. And we and gotta hear this now. This is miseducation. So as of today, once you hear what we're gonna talk about today, and as we continue on, you're gonna have to discard everything that you've been taught as something that you believe in if you do not want to be controlled by other people. Okay. Continue, Ty. He will find his proper place and will stay in it. You do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, he will cut one for his special benefit. His well, education. education. His education makes it necessary. Now. Now. This is why you and I have been in the predicament that we are in. Now, we got to stop and consider, I said, the tools that he gave to you to function within the simulated reality. This is called a mind, and I keep saying this. And I know how hard it is for you to discard the concept of a mind. The mind is just like what Eta tried to help us understand even greater about the matrix, you know, the new world order, the social construct, the simulated race, all the same, the box is all the same thing. That's right. It's a method of thinking or a way of thinking that caused you to have to accept what someone has taught you and you believe in it, and as you believe in it, it calls you to act accordingly. Call you to act accordingly. Now we got to understand, you know, that you know we need to conceptualize what we keep talking about about the brain. Now, there's another story I could tell you about the brain, but this came up today within our Goliath and my session we had with another brother explaining about the brain, not the mind, the uh -huh. brain, because you've got to understand there is a difference. Very you know, you cool. said we got to understand we need to animate the brain and how is the brain animated it's animated through consciousness now what did have what happened with this word consciousness this is again uh, all this is all flowing right together now i'm gonna read something from you it says i'm reading and this came from the documentary comatica i told you about it went up to go there comatica it's the first five minutes of comatica documentary tell you exactly what I'm finna read to you. It says, ultimately, the greatest discovery of our Earth. The Earth is a physical element. It is not something that's not physical. Okay? And again, it says, it's consciousness. The Earth is consciousness. You know and I know the Earth have to be conscious. It's a living organism. Because you throw a seed out there yeah. and what? It'll sprout up. You see yeah. grass and trees sprouting up. It's a living organism. 
But now let me show you what they did. And this is the trick again. It says a visible attribute of consciousness is an energetic field. Now, this is the term we've been using, energetic, right? Yeah. It didn't say it's spiritual. It said it's an energetic field. Right. So now let's think of the earth as an energetic field that governs the shaping of organisms. Now we know that. How do a tree get shaped? <laughs> How do a tree get shaped? How do a carrot get shaped? Right. How do an apple get shaped? Let's be real about this. We got to think. We got to think. And that's not the best term. I'm just, you know, we we in this dualistic trying to explain something holistic, and you know, it, it becomes very difficult. But you understand what I'm saying? We got to know, and I'm using the word, we right. have to know right. as opposed to thinking now. Right. We right. got to know. Okay. So it says a visible attribute of consciousness is an energetic field that. The shape to explain this very shaping of tissues, organs, and entire organism. So what he's saying here is that consciousness is within the energetic field called the earth, and it is responsible for shaping organisms. Okay, it says consciousness is the creative force of the entire universe. It has been given many names, such as God, Yahuwah, Krishna, nature, the field, and divinity. The entire universe is in fact a single living conscious organism with complete awareness of itself. Now, when you look at the definition of consciousness, the other element of consciousness, once you become conscious, it says what? Awareness. That's the definition that everybody views. That's the definition that everybody uses and believes. Now, but let's go back again. It says that it is a living single organism with complete awareness of itself. Now, what, what did, in the 1500s to the 1700s, what did Isaac Newton, Galileo, all them did, they shifted away from the living organism, that's what they say now, away from it to what? The universe being called a what? A machine. This is what they did. And so now the controversy that the universe now as a metaphor. So you see the universe as being a metaphor. Then you start to what? Metaphorically, you understand, relating to everything. Well, that's just the way things are. Now, so when we understand this, he goes on to say, he said the entire universe is in fact a single living conscious organ with complete awareness of self. The reason why it may seem difficult to comprehend this is because our understanding is typically limited by our language. Now, this language of duality, I'm going to deal with this language of duality. Duality will not allow you to see things from a what? holistic point of view this is the problem this creates a serious problem in terms of trying to understand because you are trying to what look at things more than one way more than holding it you what you really believe in duality you really believe in the mind you really believe that you know, you're struggling within yourself to reject the idea of a mind. You ask anybody, so well, that's a hard concept, you know, but that's what they told Yeshua. You know, when he tried, he said, but this is a hard concept to, 
well, you 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 come from some other place and right. you 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 got another way of looking at things. Hard concept. Right. Ain't nothing changed. You know, programming, simulated reality. So last point on this wild, he said. When we hear the term conscious organism, now listen carefully, we tend to anthropomorphize its definition by giving it human qualities. Uh -huh. Now, this is where your problem is. <laughs> when you hear consciousness, you give it human qualities. <laughs> and once you give it human quality, it loses the real significance and power that it has from an organic standpoint say that again anytime from an organic standpoint go ahead absolutely, absolutely. that's right now you reduce from the organic to the inorganic simulated reality you say oh well you know of course i know it's a, it's a greater power than myself i ain't got no power well, if you right. don't have no power, right. then that's why you are in the predicament that you are. That's absolutely correct. So, anthropomorphize. Now, I'm going to go to another point, expand upon that. And this is from one of the writings of the Father. He called it Yeshua, the Hebrew Messiah, Jesus the Christian Christ, part two. It's called the final confrontation. Part two was called the final confrontation. Again, he wrote this book from writings that I gave him. This is where this comes from. I gave him the book that he wrote this from. It was called the, uh, um, the Greek Orthodox Church. It's uh, beliefs and understanding or something similar to that. That's where he got this from. Now, he makes a point here. This is the point I want to come to. He said, certainly, this was not attached to the Greek. This was not accidental. For the Greeks knew that if the people were allowed to live worshiping according to Hebraic expectations, the Messianic lineage would continue, and another Messiah would definitely emerge in the midst of the people. Now, I'm going to stop right there. I want to explain something about a Messiah. See, again, the Greeks made it appear yes. that it was only one Messiah, and they, they did define who it was. It became the Jesus Christ those. Correct. Okay, this Catholic Church. But now, when you really understand this term, Messiah, what it really means, you will then understand what Ezekiel was saying about everybody is a Messiah because everybody has the responsibility to save themselves. Okay? We continue on. It says, in their attempt to defy, quote, and I'm going to say, here it says Yah Israel. I'm gonna say that right here we're gonna say the knowledge of you know of truth. I just use that term. And his prophets, they therefore instituted Greco-Roman Jesus Christos as the last of the messianic lineage setting the stage for the rejection of the inevitable return of the true Hebraic Messianic presence. The so Messianic presence, we always believe it was one individual. That's right. And so now with the one individual, you, you know, looks every place other than trying to identify the one, and none of us, is in agreement with the one individual. That's one of the main things among Hebrew camps right now. Right. No one can agree upon one individual. You know, therefore they stay what? Disconnected again. Moving on, he says. Now here's the point. The anthropomorphized 
creation of Greek thinking. Now, that's what I just read to you. Right. Just read this to you. Go back again. See, when you understand, say that what we do, we automatically anthropomorphize consciousness, give it human qualities. So here we go. Go to the anthropomorphized creation of Greek thinking, Greek thinking, giving what? You know, consciousness a way of thinking from a human standpoint undoubtedly could be an anointed Hellenistic savior using the way the Greeks think. I said thinking is a tool. This thing called a mind is a tool working against you. It says using Greek mindset, that word is, they craftily fashion the fictitious manner in which the eternal pathway to salvation would tread. The eternal pathway by way of quote unquote Greek thinking or what they call the mind. Now with the mind, let's see where we go with the mind and how it relates to another downfall of other. I'm looking in Webster's nice collegiate dictionary at the word belief. Now, we started off reading from the article where it said, our greatest power over black people has to do with we controlling what they believe. Definition, belief. It says, it means to alter. That's their etymology, it means to alter, okay? Then the definition number one, it says a state or habit of mind hmm. in which trust or confidence is placed in some person or thing. Uh -huh. I'm gonna read that to you. A state or a habit of mind so your mind has what become habitual in terms of you believing in it and in your habitual belief in the mind it makes you have confidence and trust in it but i asked the question what have the mind provided for us See? what has the mind provided for us? a state or habit of mind in which trust or confidence is placed in some person or thing. Well, what is this thing? This thing, but you can't even point to the thing called the mind. What is it? You actually believe it's a thing and you point to your head, <laughs> you know, when your mind tells you that you got, you understand, a mind. Continuing on, belief, definition number two, something believed, specifically a tenant or a body of tenants held by a group. Is that what we follow after? That's right. Some religious tenants held by some religious group. Something believe specifically a tenant or body of tenants believe by a group number three conviction of the truth of some statement or the reality of something being or phenomenal especially when based on examination or evidence well first of all once you get a mind you don't do no, you understand, examination, you understand, outside of what you believe, uh, and then you confidence in what you believe with the mind that you've been given. And as a result, there's no examination. When somebody do some examining and what do some research and come forth with something outside of the way you've been programmed to believe, 
you what? Automatically go to war against that and say what they are talking about is not in harmony with the direction that you want to go. Now, I think it's outside the box. Right, right. <laughs> exactly. They call it with being in the box, right? Right. They only examine what's inside the box. Inside, exactly. That's only right. examine what's inside the box. Now, my next point is the word believe. That was believe. Now we're going to the word believe. Believe. You know, one of the things that, you know, uh, it they made it appear that faith in thing. You know, you say, well, I got faith. You know, you must have faith. In order to what? You know what I'm saying? Worship the creator, you got to have faith. But here's what it says. Definition believe. You know, the uh, uh, or the etymology means to allow, okay, to allow, to believe. Then it says, number one, to have a firm religious faith. Now, when it's firm, that means then it is not, you understand, back and forth. You know, it's kind of stable. You follow what I'm saying? When it's firm, very strong in your belief. That's what is required Getting to a point where I'm saying that the tool that we've been given is fictitious. Continuing on, it says, B, to accept trustfully, trustfully and on faith. Well, that's it to, yeah, okay. Yeah. Wait, wait a minute, yeah. let me make sure. Trustfully, uh, too, and to have a firm conviction as to reality or goodness of something. Okay? Now, let me go back. To accept trustfully and on faith. Okay, then it said to have a firm conviction as to the reality of goodness of something. Three, to hold an opinion of, or to think, to hold an opinion and to think. And so this is, this is the whole thing about the mind now. Last point, it says, uh, I believe from the verb transit, it says to consider to be true or honest. Last point to hold as an opinion, okay? So suppose, <laughs> and so when you suppose and hold to these opinions and you argue and protect, you know what I'm saying, that interest in what you've been programmed to believe is what prevents anything that is truthful from within yourself to have an opportunity to come forth. So, with that said, we want to kind of like now move from there to show us how this has worked against us. Now, everybody has been struggling with conceptualizing and understanding the things that are being taught. And this is the point that I mentioned uh, about the sisters that I'm really, really concerned. Because again, if we try to pursue this knowledge of the organic, you know, cosmic, holistic way of function, trying to utilize the concept of a mind coming out of a dualistic way, you are trying to figure out two aspects of something that should not be perceived as two, but one. And as a result of that programming, it has hampered our ability to see things in its true state. So I titled this portion, Cognitive Enhancement Strategies. Now, I told you that the word cognition does not mean to think. It has maybe been stated by, you know, 
someone that it means to think. But by definition, it does not mean to think. It means to know. So cognitive enhancement strategies is simply stating the ability to what? Strategize within one's conscious, organic, cosmic self and find the answer within self. Now, that's what we have to strategize at now. We have to go inside, intuitive. And I start out by saying this. The first thing we need to do is to retrospect. And then we must introspect. First, let's look back at the historical yes. reference that has been laid out for us. And then let us look within. Let us look within, introspect. Let's go inward. Let us look intuitive, not based upon the traditional beliefs. The traditional beliefs that we have been programmed to have faith in. Let's set that aside, okay? Let us go back to the time of the two paradigms, science and the church. Now, science and the church. And you know, they told us there was a separation of church and state, you know, and we believe that. So once we accepted, you know, that there was a difference between church and state, if you wasn't treated correctly by the state, where did you go? You go to the church, you understand, where you know God was, and he was going to what? Help you, and he was going to guide you in terms of how to succeed. There was never a separation of church and state. They recognized how to what? Strategize by giving you a concept or a thought process or what they call a mind, and you would use that mind, you understand, however you program to use it through that your correct. education. Okay, so let's continue on. This is a quote now from Turning Point. It's in the older copy of page 38 and 39, and this is what it states. Scientific revolution began with Nicolaus Copernicus, who overthrew the geocentric view of Ptolemy and the Bible that had been accepted dogma for more than a thousand years. So here we find that science confronted what is referred to as the church's view as dogma for a thousand years and science overthrew it, confronted it. Now, because, now listen to this, because what was taking place that the traditional church view, people had got fed up with it because it wasn't producing nothing but what? Causing the church to have possession of everything. <laughs> so the people were fed up with it. Same way with they were, politics. <laughs> can't he tell? They Same. were open to anything that was what? Seemingly change their predicament. Right. But understanding that is the same idea, same objective of the same individual, you know, in the interest of the same individual to keep them in opposition to one another through dualism. Moving on. He said, after Copernicus, the earth was no longer the center of the universe, but merely a minor star at the edge of the galaxy, and man was robbed of his proud position as a central figure of God's creation. Now, what have we been talking about? We've been talking about you being in what? That's central right. Of everything. That's right. But they shifted it from what? The earth and you, your relationship with that. Remember now what we just stated about the earth. We said the earth is a field of consciousness, right? 
<laughs> but you are in the earth and you are in you know an integral part of the earth how could the earth be conscious and you not be conscious except you are programmed to what reject your relationship with the earth and believe that there's a separation between the earth and you by virtue of what the church has taught you or by virtue of what science teaches you that's right we go on we say the role of galileo in the scientific revolution goes far beyond beyond achievements in astronomy although these are most widely known because of his clash with the church so here we find galileo had a clash with the church now in his clash let's see what occurred we said the worldview and value system that lie at the basis of our culture and it has to be carefully re-examined were formulated in their essential outlines in the 17th in the 16th and 17th century between 1500 and 1700 there was a dramatic shift in the way people pictured the world and in their whole way of thinking. So how was they thinking prior to the 1500s? They were thinking holistically. They were thinking holistically, living in a holistic environment. Their new mentality and new perception of the cosmos gave our western civilization the features that are characteristic of the modern era so we're talking about what 1500 600 years we talk about 500 500 close to five close to 600 years that you've been under a concept that they are now defining as the modern era okay so from 1500 the dominant worldview in europe as well as in most other civilizations were most other civilizations were were organic now here we go we talked about the organic you know cosmic reality and, and the inorganic, you know, simulated reality. So, but they believed and lived in, you know, a belief system and an environment that was organic. People lived in small, cohesive communities and experienced nature in terms of organic relationship. In other words, their relationship with the creation was one in the same because they were an integral part of the creation characterized by the interdependence of spiritual or energetic and material phenomena and the subordination of individual needs to those of the community the scientific framework of this organic worldview rested on two authorities aristotle the greek and the church in the 13th century thomas aquinas combined aristotle's comprehensive system hold on one minute in time go ahead put that one. i got it comprehensive system of nature with christian theology and ethics Christian theology and ethics, and in doing so, established the conceptual framework that remained unquestioned throughout the Middle Ages. So now we got Greek and Christian theology and ethics that had been put together by those framers of the new way of thinking 
has nothing to do with an organic relationship. It's moving you into the simulated reality. And from that point on, and from that point on, this is where our problems actually begin to be monumentally put, you understand, in place that we are struggling with this very day. This is where it was stated. The nature of the medieval science was very different from that of contemporary science. It was based upon based on both reason and its main goal was to understand the meaning and significance of things rather than prediction and control. So when you predict something, this is what you call prophecy. You foretell an event, and when that event occurs, it is called history. So now, when we go back to what we asked everybody to really pay close attention to, was her story to his story. Right. So that we could see that this whole thing about history, we have to now look at things totally different from the way we've been told and the way history has been calculated. If we do not, we will find ourselves losing, you understand, the knowledge of what the elders had what? Given us that has been dormant in our experience in the simulated reality that if we ain't careful, we will not activate it because what? We will not accept anything outside of the box. <clears throat> the myth. So what it goes on to say, you know, the nature of science is very, very different from the contemporary science. It was based on both reason and its main goal was to understand the meaning and significance of things rather than uh prediction and control now let's see what happened though as something that happened it shifted quickly to that which would be what the dominant idea of control all of that was just thrown in there so to speak to make it appear that it was about some kind of reality of uh you know toward the people i go on to say Thus, in the process of time, this idea became a major weapon that of, that of the dramatic shift, which was away from the cosmic organic reality to that of the material simulated reality, which was to include the Christian theology of a concept defined as God being in the external heavens as and you on earth this concept became one of the main forces that have been used to control the masses of humanity as long as they keep you believing in an external god in the heavens and you on the earth you believe that they have power over you and that power causes them to what? Set back and what? Allow you to believe in this external force while what they put in you has to become the controlling force, which is nothing but a lie. Quote, the medieval scientists looking for the purpose underlying various natural phenomena considered questions relating to God, the human soul, and the ethics to be of the highest significance. The medieval age, which was the outlook, changed radically in the 16th and 17th century. The notion of an organic living and spiritual universe, energetic universe, was replaced by that of the world as a machine. And the world machine became the dominant metaphor of the modern era. Now, everything that you've been reading 
in the scriptures has been historical. But you've got to go back to anthropomorphizing. When you saw those, you understand, concepts written in scripture, instead of looking at them from a metaphorical, allegorical point of view, that's right. You know, you start to see them as historical. Right. And now it's historical belief in the Bible. And everybody that done taught us told us it was a history book. It was our history. Now you got to ask yourself, it was our history. It's been a history of doom and gloom. Now, if our history is all doom and gloom, we have to ask ourselves, why and what did we do to produce you know what I'm saying? A history of nothing but doom and gloom. That's right. What could you have done? That's the kind of question we got there. That's what we got. So let's do. look at the word radical. See a radical change. So do we see the significance of being radical in our methods today? Because that's what was required, you know, what I'm to create the condition, it was radical. You know, it can't be passive, radical. The root, 1641. It said the basic principle, foundation, marked by a considerable departure. Now, I don't say considerable, how much? Let's say considerable. How much is that? Departure from the usual or traditional. Now, and you depart from the tradition. What was the tradition? Now, what did the Azure say? Ye by your traditions has made the word of God null and void and effect. So, but we know here that people live in a holistic way, cohesive, you know, organic relationship. So if you depart from it, and what they did, totally departed, not considerable, totally departed from it. And the next word for tradition, they say the word extreme. They went to the extreme, the ultimate. And it says, tending to or disposed to make extreme changes in existing views, habits, conditions, or instruction. So your instructions and your what habits and your way of doing things was considerably changed from what the original organic way things were hear me when you begin to accept this and understand this this is this radical way of taking you away from what you know to now what you believe and can't prove. We got to consider this. Continuing on, it says, C, relating to a constitution, constituting a political group associated with views, practices, and policies of extreme change. Now, this is where humanity are today. Have no idea that they have come under such, you know, group associated views, not just individual, but group practices and policies of an extreme change that took place during the 16th and 1700th that set the standard for what everybody is believing in today. Continue on. The radical change was from the organic living spiritual or energetic holistic universe to that of an inorganic world machine as a metaphor, which became the inorganic simulated reality. Now, the strategy of the 16th and 17th century was to radically remove all knowledge of the melanated, melanin carbonated species of any connection 
to their power that they had ever known. It worked perfectly, perfectly. Once this was done to accomplish the objective of the scientists, it was to reverse the true history along with their wealth and all melanin carbonated knowledge of its people. To make it possible for scientists to describe nature mathematically, Galileo postulated, which meant to assume or claim as true. And you see, this is what has happened. Once you come under the influence of the simulated reality, you come into faith and belief in that reality. So whatever is taught in that reality, that becomes the programming that has to be ran in your day-to-day -day life. And in your day-to-day -day life, then you accept what has been claimed or what has been assumed or postulated as being true as being true with no way of verifying it said so that they should restrict themselves to the studying of the essential properties of material bodies shapes numbers and movement each time i've been talking about this consistently which could be measured and quantified that's the so measure. now mathematics becomes a major tool other properties like color sound taste or smell were merely subjective mental projection which should be excluded from the domain of science now why it had to be excluded because what like color sound taste or smell how do you measure it? you know how do you calculate it I, you I know? See, those are the functions of the senses the functions of the That's Absolutely. Right. Those are functions of the senses as opposed to the mind. That's correct. So once we came under that influence, you know, things became what? Difficult. And sisters, hear me. That things that you see, things that you are able to utilize your senses, don't allow your senses to what? be trapped in the influence of a mind based upon something you've been taught. Allow your sense organs to what? Reveal to you what is as opposed to, quote unquote, the tool they gave you called a mind. Moving on. What we want to do is look back at the strategies that was used during the 15 and 1700s. <laughs> which were to create cognitive dissonance. Now, this is what the strategy was. The strategy, you know, you know, remember the title, you know, cognitive enhancement strategies, you know. Now, they had to strategize as to how they would what? Prevent what you knew to be the way and the correctness of things, how to function, what you should do it, be doing, how to do it. They had to create a strategy to what? Hold that. That's where the mind comes in again. Here we go. The strategy, and we're going to give a definition of strategy. Okay, 1810, they say, a careful plan or method. Okay. Then it said, now that's the noun. The adjective says, a necessary or important in the imitation, conduct, or completion of a strategic plan. An imitation, conduct, or completion. So if you got a conduct that is an imitation, not real, you know, and that's the strategy that they would use. They would have you doing things that you believe 
is correct because what? You've been trained and it was passed down, what you would call historically, but it was a historical lie. Going on, it says, required for the conduct of war and not available in quantities domestically. Now let's go back. Remember what the brother said in her story and his story. The term domestic. This is a term where they label women, you know, when they were domestic, you know, working in the homes, right. you know, of Jewish people. But domestication is what they brought all of, you understand, uh, uh, melanated people on the took them out of their what original way you know of relating to nature and their relationship to the creation and they domesticated them and it's like they do with animals you bring an animal in and you domesticate them you take them out of what you right. call the wild right and you bring them into your house and you start to feed him and treat him like you know he's like you so what they did, you know, go back, all our mothers worked for some Jewish, you understand, European, Albert man, you know, what did they want you around them for? Because what you knew, you was going to tell them because they treated you good. You know, so all this is a part of a strategy, keeping you who possess the knowledge closed by so they could learn from you and then turn around and use it against you. Not, not say. Mark a shot. That is that 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 is so uh, insightful. In the uh, Song of Solomon, <clears throat> it talks about just what you said. The first chapter, how uh, the uh, divine feminine said that she has uh, that 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 she has kept other people's vineyard, done their domestic work, but her vineyard, she she hasn't watched over and absolutely right right you know this is a consistent strategy not only in the scriptures but throughout history so that's right tremendously right. right right he i also think it's in the fifth chapter of isaiah talk about my vineyard you know same right yeah same, right, same right right same thing right continuing on it says Required for the conduct of war and not available in quantities domestically. Three, designed or trained to strike an enemy at the source of his military, economic, or political power. Wow. That is how you live in relationship to all things. This would be your source. And it would be a strategy to strike at you in these areas where you would be what? Powerless. You would now have to depend upon an external somebody for to assist you in all that you did. Continuing on. It says, within the process of time, this radical cause melanated people and virtually all human to lose their ability to know all things through intuition this was is the reason the concept to know was radically changed to that of thought or thinking this would render one to consider another idea than holism such as reason or rationalism as being one's intelligence due to this particular way of viewing everything by virtue of francis bacon forcefully advocating this concept it became the new world view though all of humanity accepted this idea because of force 
In time, it became the metaphor suggesting that the entire cosmos, universe, and the way it functioned was, is no other than as an organic, not, I mean, other than an organic system. In other words, the organic system lost its way of being acknowledged, and it was replaced by, you know, this so-called universe being the function of a system that was dualistic. So when you look at the word dualism, that's what exactly what they say. You know, two ways of the system, you know, of the universe, how it functions, one good and the other evil. It's a, this truly is the manner of how the simulated reality came into existence. Now we go to a most significant point here. This particular point here is centered around a statement that Francis Bacon made. He said, through research, we have found that it was Francis Bacon that was, it, that it was Francis, Francis Bacon that who boldly attacked traditional schools of thought and developed a veritable passion for scientific experimentation. So it was Francis Bacon that was responsible for attacking the traditional schools of thought of a living organism being the cosmos, the earth, as a living organism with complete knowledge of Francis Bacon attacked that school of thought viciously. And he referred to, to the develop a veritable passion for scientific experimentation. Supposedly, this veritable passion for scientific experimentation was to what? Verify his way of looking at things. So let's look at the word veritable. Veritable as an adjective. Being in fact the thing named or imaginary often used to stress the aptness or fastness of a metaphor, imaginary, not real now, but imaginary, 14th century, existing only in imagination, lack in factual reality, formed or characterized by imaginatively or arbitrarily. So now we find everything that they are what? Using through these experiments, he had what he called a veritable passion, which is simply imaginary to what verify it had no factual reality, but the objective was to convince you that in these experiments, that this is the way the universe functions. And it would function based upon the definition that they would define as to the function. Now, continuing on, it said the word app, because you said, well, what is this aptness? It says suited to a purpose, especially being to the point keenly intelligent and responsive. So they made you think, think that, wow, what they were doing was supreme intelligence. And this way of being intelligent verified how the universe functions. Now remember what it done done. Now it didn't remove man from the center of everything and made the sun, external sun out there, what he I've been talking to us about, about that, you understand, energy is not the energy that we can survive on. That's correct. It is not economic as he's taught us. So they have removed the earth from being the center and you being in the earth as the center of things and created a fictionary, you know, uh, idea, a fictitious idea of something that is not the center. And of course, we bought it. The synonym for the word aptness, it connotes a 
fitness marred by nicety and discrimination. It said, it, then it goes on to say, um, uh, worthy of acceptance or belief as conforming to fact or reality, trustworthy. So now, imaginary thing that is imaginary we now have been made to believe is trustworthy the belief in a force outside of self that you are disconnected from right. that is going to what have some mercy on you for being a evil you know what I'm saying person uh unrighteous person that you're going to repent from your unrighteousness and then what they going to what come to you to help you now this is this is the kind of thinking that we have been given after reviewing this definition we can see the deceitfulness within all that the average man has ever accomplished and ever will truly he is the father of a lie and the truth does not abide within him although he is the father of a lie Many of the melanin carbonated species still have faith in the average man. The veritable person of Francis Bacon for experiments having taken humanity totally away from the absolute ability to know the truth for oneself. Today, in order to accept anything you have not heard before, you have to experience it to believe it. We have convinced ourselves that experience is one's best teacher or instructor. Truly, man that has been cognitive dissonance is in a state of complete confusion, thinking that they know, thereby preventing any growth in their consciousness. Men are now left with the idea that moral faith in an external source as God is the key to their salvation that is from the outside source. Whenever or however any salvation that is to come to man, it would be, it would be his own deliverance from cognitive dissident within himself caused by dualism slash rationalism. So we're gonna hold right there on this portion today and uh, we're going to connect the word cognition to this so that we can see and then we're going to hold at this point and then we pick up you know, how cognitive dissident introduce us to the conflict that exists within us today so when we look at the word cognition just in simple the etymology means acquainted with or to know so now if we were once acquainted with and we knew who we were are what our relationship with you know the creation was the objective would be to remove that so that we would no longer have the knowledge of it we would then have to be defined as cognitive dissidents. You know, now we are thinking in conflict with our own, you understand, know, programming, believing that we are what? You know, in conflict because what I feel and what I know is not one and the same. I feel it in my gut, but my mind my thoughts is telling me something else so here you find yourself cognitive dissonance or in other words psychologically you know in conflict and this is where humanity is today so the strategy that was used was to enhance cognitive dissonance it was not to enhance your cognition or your what ability to know this is what we have to do now. We have to begin to understand that cognitive dissident causes us to lose 
the intuitive understanding of who we are and the power that we possess in our relationship to all things, you know, we now must what? Become what? Cognitive awareness or cognitive conscious, you know, so that we will know that the thing that we would, you know, come forth with now from within our internal being, that gut feeling, you know, what you know, but you may not be able to work verify based upon the simulated reality that exists and the history that they have what used to verify the lie. Therefore, you find yourself, you understand, uh, coursing yourself again because you may not, cannot historically, you understand, verify within the framework of time that they've established, you understand, for this cognition to, this cognitive discipline to manifest itself. So we'll hold at this point today, Itai, and uh, we'll pick up uh, same place tomorrow, okay? Okay.